You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the deputy comment editor at The Telegraph, Annabelle Denham, and the director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow, Kezia Dugdale. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. I've won a big concession from EU, claims Sunak. That's lead on the front page of The Times tomorrow, covering Rishi Sunak's meeting, as we just heard, with EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. The Daily Telegraph is also leading on the Brexit story, with the news that Tory MPs are issuing warnings on the content of the deal, saying it must be put to a vote. The Daily Mail focuses on Rishi Sunak's new Brexit deal with Brussels, saying it may settle the thorny issue of trade arrangements for Northern Ireland, but could trigger another Tory civil war. The Daily Express also leads on the Brexit story, with Rishi Sunak's promise this deal is best for Britain. While the Metro goes with the possibility of ending this Brexit nightmare over Northern Ireland, covering EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's visit to Britain tomorrow. Meanwhile, The Sun leads on justice for Joanna, with Dominic Raab promising to meet the family of hammer attack victim Joanna Simpson. And The Daily Star leads with uh, What's That Lassie? You're nearly extinct. The news that only 500 collie dogs were born in the UK last year. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by the Deputy Comment Editor at The Telegraph, Annabelle Denham, and the Director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow, Kezia Dugdale. Welcome to you both. Let's start with the uh, Daily Express, uh, seemingly what one story in town on many of the, the front pages, and this is this meeting tomorrow between the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, in the hopes of uh, taking the Brexit deal, the post-trade uh, Brexit deal regarding Northern Ireland, over the line, finally. Do we think we are there, Kezia? Yes, I think we can be fairly confident, and certainly the Prime Minister is very confident that there'll be some sort of resolution by the end of play tomorrow. Bear in mind, Dominic Raab was doing the media round this morning, and when he was asked about the prospect of a, de of a deal, he said he thought it would be days rather than weeks. That was a very short-lived answer because it now looks like a real act of confidence to have Ursula von der Leyen on her way to the United Kingdom to meet with the Prime Minister tomorrow. You've had more details there from Sam about the prospect of a cabinet and also the prospect of a, a kind of joint podium press conference um, late tomorrow afternoon. All of those details suggest there's real confidence now of a deal being done. Annabelle, your, your thoughts, do you think, uh, as uh, Kezia does, that this is, uh, we're coming towards the, the finish line, shall we say? Well, I mean, I think we need to see, I think we need to see the Brexit process as something that is going to be constantly evolving. So whatever details uh, come to light tomorrow, I think we can be fairly confident that's not going to be the end of it. But certainly it seems like great leaps have been taken forward and leaps that we didn't think would be possible. Let's not forget that a year or so ago, we didn't believe the EU was willing to come back to the negotiating table. And I think it's quite a remarkable uh, feat and achievement that the Prime Minister has managed to reopen the question of the Northern Ireland Protocol and try and get a better deal, uh, particularly for the people of Northern Ireland. This has been very expensive and damaging to the Northern Ireland economy, not to mention the ways in which it's threatened the stability in the region. So, you know, I think we're all sitting here on the edge of our seats, hoping that some kind of arrangement can be arrived at, one that is better than that than which Boris Johnson was able to negotiate when he was Prime Minister. Um, it's interesting to cover the Express there because, of course, Rishi Sunak has got to sell it to his own backbenchers, but he's also got to try and sell this not just to uh, the people of uh, Great Britain, but also uh, Ireland and the European Union to an extent. And I think it's certainly in his best interest if he can, can convince us all that this is indeed uh, the best deal that can be agreed at this time. So, you know, let's just wait and see because the devil really will be in the detail. Yes, and that's exactly what he, he's doing, uh, Kezia, by saying that this is the best deal for Britain.
Yes, that's right. And he can do so with a degree of confidence, knowing that the Labour Party are very, very likely to back the deal that he's putting forward, in part because they don't want to contest the next election with Brexit still being a live issue. It would suit Keir Starmer a great deal if the whole issue could be essentially buried um, for the prospectus of the next general election. So he can count on Labour votes there, more or less. And that means that the power of the DUP, the power of those Brexiteers and the Tory benches to somehow thwart this deal is diminished. Now, I don't think the threat has completely gone yet because we haven't seen the actual detail of the deal. We don't know if it's going to carry just quite enough support from the Conservatives. But like I've said, just the, the choreography of what's expected to happen tomorrow suggests that the Prime Minister is very confident of being able to um, secure support from his party. Outstanding issue of whether um, the House of Commons will have a vote on the deal still remains. It was interesting to hear politicians in the media around this morning basically say, well, I'm sure the House of Commons will find a way. That seems to suggest that the government might not orchestrate um, a vote of its own, but would be open to uh, other people trying to create a debate uh, to change the order of business to allow for that. But it may well be past the point of, of no return by the time the House of Commons gets its act together. I think once you have two leaders standing side by side at a podium saying, this is as good as it gets, it's time to, to move forward, it feels very difficult for people to stop the process at that point. Uh, Annabelle, up until this point, we've uh, been led to believe that, that the GUP are not in favour of uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, negotiations and what he, he's intending. Um, that still is the, the, the point tonight. So it's quite a, a bold move and to be so confident that uh, a deal might be, be sealed tomorrow when they still don't have the backing of the, the DUP. No, that's absolutely right. And of course, the DUP have long uh, complained about what they call a democratic uh, deficit. Uh, this is essentially the regulatory annexation of uh, Northern Ireland that's created all of these issues um, in, in the region. Um, you know, DUP uh, leader Geoffrey Donaldson has previously said that the objective in London and Brussels should be to get this right rather than rushed. He's concerned that, you know, the wrong deal would deepen, will further division rather than uh, restore power sharing. Um, I, You know, as far as I can tell, the DUP are taking a hard line on this, but will be willing to make some uh, concessions. So again, you know, we need to just see what unfolds uh, in the next 24 hours and whether they're going to think that this is a, a satisfactory uh, solution. But of course, you know, the, the fingers have been burned in the past, the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, Boris Johnson tried to insist that there wouldn't be that border down the Irish Sea. Well, that's exactly what we've ended up with. And look at all of the issues, all of the problems that that's, that's created. So, you know, let's see what happens and whether it's something they find palatable. Moving to the mail, Kezia, they're reporting that the European Commission is saying that the meeting will take place in Windsor. Uh, and this raises the prospect that uh, Mrs von der Leyen may also hold talks with King Charles. And this is something we reported on um, a, a couple of days ago, that there was a, a, a meeting. Uh, this is a story that we broke and that was then cancelled. Are you surprised that she might still be meeting the King? No, and I don't think we should worry too much about this or, or pay it too much kind of credence. If this does happen, what it represents is ceremony, what it represents is courtesy when you have the President of the European Commission who's literally in Windsor where the King would be. It would somehow seem odd, I think, if they weren't to meet, if they weren't to take that opportunity to debate about what's been discussed. But yet again, it's another aspect of the choreography that seems to suggest we're very, very close to a, a deal here. I think it's also interesting looking at the front page of the Daily Mail to see that they're kind of hedging their bets. It's, it, you normally would expect the Daily Mail to sort of tirade against any compromise on Europe that they didn't. To me, they, they think it's a done deal too. And they're just putting a little bit of extra pressure on Rishi Sunak to make sure that he can sell this deal as the best possible um, option available to the country. Annabelle, what do you, do you make of the possibility of uh, Ursula von der Leyen actually meeting with King Charles? It, might that be seen as politicising the, the monarchy or, or do you think it's just uh, normal courtesy and, and uh, protocol? Well, I think in some ways it can be both. We talk a lot, you know, in politics about the optics. And I think, you know, 
support from the king, as Sky reported, you know, would likely be quite controversial. It is going to risk those allegations that the monarch is being dragged into something that is highly uh, political. Let's not forget uh, that the late queen faced uh, criticism when she took that step into politics and she suggested that uh, voters in the Scottish referendum ought to think very carefully before they go uh, to the ballot box. And I imagine that King Charles will have that in the back of his mind when it if indeed he does uh, have tea with the president of the European uh, Commission tomorrow. So I do, you know, I can I, I can see that it's a courtesy, I can, but I also think that there's a real risk here that uh, it will be viewed as the monarch stepping into very, a uh, very political issue. Let's talk about the fact that uh, some commentators, and the, the Mail is one of those mentioning that um, any deal could trigger another Tory civil war, that his own backbenchers are, are probably his, his greatest critics in this, and this could really just flare everything up once again. Kezia. So, so this is really interesting. There are a few key people to watch in this regard. You've already had snippets tonight of uh, Mark Francois from the ERG group saying that as a group, they're not stupid. They want to see the detail of this very closely before they uh, set out their position. But any role whatsoever of the European court still having a say over how the protocol operates would be unpalatable to them. So I think we can anticipate some um, some strong trouble from them in the days ahead. The question is, how big are they? How influential are they uh, now? Uh, how much could they determine any sort of final change of track? The other person to look out for is Steve Baker. And there's some really interesting detail on the Telegraph front page with regards to his role. We know that he was invited to Downing Street today to meet with the Prime Minister. And although he didn't pass any comment when he came out of the front door, he did give the thumbs up. Now, that's going to surely, uh, the image of that alone would surely bring Rishi Sunak even more comfort to me. Annabelle, just uh, very quickly, in less than, than a minute, would you say that his worst detractors, that is Rishi Sunak, are within his own party? Uh, yes, I think, uh, you know, let's not forget that around 24 hours ago, there, there was talk that Steve Baker was himself on resignation watch. Of course, Boris Johnson has let his opposition to a possible deal uh, be known. Um, I think a lot of the so-called Spartans um, still worry about what the detail is going to be, what will the application of EU law be in Northern Ireland, uh, how far will the concessions on state aid and uh, VAT go, will the grace period stay, what will happen to uh, Boris Johnson's Northern Ireland Protocol bill. There are, there are a lot of questions there. And I think, it, you know, it's entirely possible that if he doesn't get satisfactory, uh, they don't get satisfactory answers, then there could be some kind of Conservative backbench rebellion. I mean, uh, about a week ago, there was talk of over 100 yeah. uh, Conservative backbenchers voting against it. But okay. there may Annabelle. not even be a vote. But... You, you raise a lot of questions there that do need... Uh... Welcome back. You are watching the press preview here on Sky News. And back with me is the deputy comment editor at The Telegraph, Annabelle Denham, and the director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow, Kezia Dugdale. Uh, welcome back to both of you. Let's um, start by having a look. Uh, it's covered in a couple of the papers, but we'll start with the Metro. And this is this awful story of the... 59 migrants that have been killed off the coast of... Uh, southern coast of, of Italy. Um, tragic story, bodies being washed up on shore uh, and dozens more thought to be missing, actually, after this disaster, Annabelle. Yes, I mean, it, it's absolutely terrible. And I think that, you know, it's uh, our asylum seeking is such a political hot potato in this country. And I think sometimes it's hotly debated and you you forget this all the human element to it, this perilous journey that people take um, to seek safe haven. Um, and, you know, in this instance, unfortunately, some of them haven't made it. At, at the latest that I read was that at least 59 migrants, including 12 children, uh, died. Dozens more uh, feared missing after their boat sank uh, in rough seas off uh, southern Italy. And, you know, like I say, unfortunately, these tragic events do occur too often. Hundreds are dying in the Mediterranean uh, every year after trying to seek uh, asylum in Europe. And I think while Rishi Sunak is currently uh, tied up in these Brexit negotiations, he also has his asylum bill to push through Parliament at some point in the coming weeks um, to try uh, and, and sort out you know, this, this thorny and difficult situation that his predecessors have completely failed at. And that's not just predecessors, of course, here uh, in the UK, but also European leaders. Macron has talked very tough on uh, 
uh, clamping down on illegal immigration, but has uh, yet to act on on those words, um, just as British uh, British leaders have failed to uh, as well. So, you know, let's see what happens with that in the coming weeks and, and whether we're able to address it to prevent these stories from these tragic events from happening in the future. Indeed. And Kezia, the Italian media, Giorgia Maloney, she's vowed a, a crackdown on people smuggling. And we know that uh, at least one person has already been uh, arrested in Italy. Yes, and of course, she's a recently elected far-right leader who, who doesn't take a particularly um, positive view of asylum seekers, no matter the horrendous nature of the circumstances that they fled. When you look at the images associated with this story, um, we're used to seeing dinghies in the channel. What, what this represents is a, is a wooden boat, 170 people expected to be on this wooden boat from five days travelling from Turkey to the southern coast of Italy. We know that 80 people have been rescued and, as Annabelle's outlined, 58 people declared dead, including every single child on board. We also know that the majority of the people on this boat came from Afghanistan, Somalia and Pakistan. At least two of those countries you could describe as war-torn, people who was, you would expect to have very legitimate and sincere claims for asylum. So I think, once again, this is going to put the issue of how to support people who are fleeing such horrors and um, to make a better life for themselves right at the forefront of our political agenda. Uh, Annabelle, just uh, quickly, the, the FT, the, the same story. They're, they're talking about uh, an escalating confrontation between the government, the Italian Prime Minister, um, as Kezi was saying, is, is right-wing, and humanitarian organisations that carry out the, the rescue missions in the Mediterranean Sea. There's, there's been a distinct clash. Yes, there has. And I mean, look, this is not altogether uh, surprising that you're going to see uh, NGOs who are on the coalface dealing with uh, these tragic events, uh, clashing with uh, political leaders, particularly if they're far right and they're taking a very unsympathetic view of uh, illegal immigration. Um, you, you know, that question of, of how many people we, we let in, um, the idea that we need to, to clamp down on, on this illegal immigration, on asylum seekers coming over, not, not just, of course, to Italy, but also coming into the UK. It's just this fierce, nasty uh, political debate. Um, and Sunak, of course, like I said, uh, you know, is promising that claims are going to be heard in a matter of days or weeks, not months and years, that failed applicants will be sent to an alternative safe country, where that it be that where they came from, uh, or indeed, of course, Rwanda, um, deporting those who are judged to be ineligible for asylum. Again, it sounds like a government that's going to get tough on this with a view, they say, to trying to ultimately clamp down on people traffickers um, from the people who are trying to make a business of really preying on others' uh, misery and their desperation to flee from their war-torn country. So, uh, you know, like I say, I, I, I just think this is going to escalate until the government uh, grasps the nettle and comes up with some kind of uh, solution that is that is reasonable Annabelle. Um, and sympathetic, of course. Indeed. Annabelle and Kezia, thank you so much for taking us through the papers.